Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit about climate change and mitigation. So we've already talked a bit about the science of climate change and why there's reason to be concerned about the trajectory that we have with respect to emissions and temperatures, global temperatures. Now, this is where we get to take a chance to talk a little bit about what those different future scenarios might look like and some possibilities for addressing them. So when, when I'm talking mitigation, I just want to be clear again what we're, we're addressing here. So we have greenhouse gas concentrations that are increasing climate change, which is causing impacts on the world. And then we have uh, a few different responses we can make. Uh, one uh, pathway is to adaptation, which is trying to change what we're doing so that we're better prepared to deal with these impacts of climate change. The focus I'm going to be looking at here is at mitigation. So this is a response where we say, let's decrease our emissions uh, so that we can decrease this overall cycle and the impact of climate change, right? So cutting it off at its source by de decreasing uh, emissions. All right. So the IPCC uh, estimates that I've talked about before look at climate change and how it might occur in the future. That uses these complex models that look at different types of emissions, different types of temperature cycles, um, uh, what we know about population expectations, industry, etc., cetera, uh, to try and model out what we anticipate future scenarios to be given uh, changes in how we emit different types of uh, greenhouse gases. So the IPCC has put together a few different scenarios. The scenarios are, are RCP 8.5, RCP 6, RCP 4.5, and RCP 2.6. So RCP 8.5 is kind of a worst case scenario where there's extensive use of coal and it's essentially business as usual. We actually don't think that that's very likely because uh, it looks like we're actually doing a pretty good job of moving ourselves away from that worst case scenario. So that's, that's good. Uh, R RCP 6 and RCP 4.5 are sort of partial responses and 2.6 is a kind of a best case scenario where we actually make extensive changes. Uh, to uh, the emissions that we are producing. So based upon the IPCC report and a knowledge about these climate change issues, we did come to a, uh, uh, come together uh, for the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015 where uh, countries across the globe agreed to set uh, um, goals for what they were going to do to decrease their emissions and deal with the issue of climate change. So this was a wildly, widely heralded, really exciting uh, international response to climate change. And it's very important because it is this international statement that we're going to try and work together to, to address this problem. Um, now, the, the only country in the, United, in the world that isn't uh, currently part of the Paris Climate Agreement is the United States. Uh, the Trump administration withdrew us from, from that agreement. Um, uh, uh, I think in 2017, 2016, 2017, it hasn't become official yet, but uh, we're in the process of currently withdrawing. Um, but there is international consensus and agreement that uh, people want to, that countries want to work on this. And that's exciting. Um, I will also note that uh, a fair number of states have independently decided that they still want to pursue the Paris Climate Agreement uh, efforts to decrease emissions. So that's exciting. Washington State was one of the first three states that founded this. And actually, the majority of the U.S. population is covered within those states that have agreed to pursue those uh, Paris uh, Climate Agreements. So that's, that's an exciting thing uh, that we see happening at a state level. Now, as good as the Paris Agreements are, I should note that they aren't quite what we need to actually effectively deal with climate change as we're seeing it. So most of the 
uh, reports back so far about countries' success at meeting their goals for climate change, they're very. A lot of countries are not actually meeting those uh, agreements at this point. So we're not quite meeting what we actually hoped we would actually do uh, with, with respect to climate action. Uh, the other thing is, though, that even if we did do what we agreed in uh, in the Paris Climate Agreement, still that wouldn't actually meet our needs in terms of minimizing climate impact. So estimates are if actually if countries actually did what they said in terms of climate climate mitigation, we would still have an increase in temperature of around 3.2 roughly degrees. So we see here for different scenarios going from essentially no policy down to a trying to cut emissions by 50%. Um, that we're still at substantial risk of, of having climate impacts that are uh, quite substantial in terms of temperature. So the, the colors, as you can see, uh, the dark gray on the bars on the side indicate uh, a, a projected range, probability of a projected range of 1 to 1 1.5 degrees. Uh, dark, light gray is 1.5 to 2 degrees, uh, uh, and then the oranges are 2.3, uh, light orange is 2 to, to 3, dark medium orange is 2, 3 to 4, and dark uh, orange is over 4. So the point here is that although the uh, Paris Climate Agreement is important, we still have a lot of work to do and we actually really would need to create much more challenging uh, objectives in order to actually minimize uh, global warming. So the IPCC report that I talked about from 2014 talked about potential warming in two possibilities. They, they considered both a two degree increase and a 1.5 degree increase. And they didn't really make a judgment as to what would be, what the implications of those two possibilities were. So they did a follow up study uh, that looked at compared 1.5 degree change versus two degrees changes. And they issued a report uh, in 2018 that talked about this. Now this report was quite sobering actually because it suggests very strongly that we, it's very much in our interest to limit our the increase in temperature to 1.5 degrees. And as I've talked about earlier, we've actually used up a lot of our carbon budget for being able to minimize uh, prevent ourselves from reaching that 1.5 mark. So we we have to make fairly fast course correction in the next roughly, they say roughly 12 years in order to prevent temperatures above 1.5 degrees. So here's some of the data that they found in the study that suggests that there really is a substantial difference in terms of 1.5 degrees versus 2 degrees. So we see extreme heat doubling or 2.6 times worse in terms of extreme heat days. Uh, we see that uh, having sea, uh, sea ice free uh, days in the Arctic uh, will be 10 times worse. So a lot more melting of ice. We see uh, increases in sea, sea level rise. Um, uh, when we look at species loss, uh, it looks like both for uh, vertebrates and plants that, that would roughly double. Uh, for insects, it'd be about three times as much. So substantial impacts on, on species. Uh, when we look at things like ecosystems and uh, what we expect to happen for them, um, we're, we expect a, about almost a, a two times increase for uh, damage to ecosystems uh, in terms of shifting to new biomes. Uh, permafrost uh, major issues, about 38% worse, and uh, major impacts on crop yields, which is really important to our food system, so about uh, two times worse there. If we look at certain other systems, uh, wa water, uh, ocean life, uh, we see that uh, we are already expecting really bad impact on coral reefs, which are really central to uh, fisheries and making sure that uh, 
um, uh, um, that uh, food, uh, international food supply for a lot of people. So uh, that would be a substantially uh, a major damage to coral reefs and a major impact on fisheries as well. So these are just some examples of what was found uh, with respect to how big of a difference we might expect uh, in the coming years for a 1.5 versus 2 degree change. And there's other information suggesting that this is substantial and some other information from other sources suggesting that there might be things that might happen that might, might even be worse. So uh, real reason for concern for that difference. So when we think about how to stabilize our carbon emissions, so it's something that we need to understand about emissions. So just stopping the increase in emissions won't actually decrease the way in which temperatures are rising. Even if we sort of halted the way in which we're increasing emissions, though, because we have such a buildup of uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, our temperatures will continue to rise. So really, we actually can't, we, we not only need to stop emissions, stop increasing emissions, we actually have to substantially decrease our emissions to hold uh, temperature steady, all right? So, the, uh, uh, and carbon dioxide steady in the atmosphere. So uh, that is a sort of a, something that is not necessarily intuitive about this, but does speak to the, the challenge that's facing us. So uh, with this uh, 1.5 degree report, the IPC put together a few different predictive models and uh, there's, it's probably a little hard to see here, but there are essentially three models shown in this graph. And one is uh, shown, uh, outlined in, in blue lines, one is outlined in gray lines, and one is outlined in purple lines. So the gray lines is, is essentially, uh, that's the central one, which is saying that we halt our carbon emissions uh, by uh, 2055, uh, but um, and we make progress towards uh, non-carbon dioxide related emissions. Right? The blue lines indicate that we stop carbon emissions by 2040, and we also make big progress towards uh, non-carbon dioxide related emissions. And then the purple lines are uh, where we uh, st uh, drop uh, our, our emissions uh, by 2055, but we don't make uh, progress with respect to um, with respect to non-carbon dioxide related emissions. So let's look at what this actually looks like uh, in an actual chart. So in in B, we see uh, the difference between the blue and the and the gray uh, possibilities in terms of projections. There, uh, that's the difference between. Uh, uh, making that, that shift by 2040 versus 2055. Um, and here we see that in the blue line, we actually halt uh, carbon dioxide emissions at a lower point. Uh, D is where you see the difference between changing the non-carbon dioxide related emissions versus not making a difference or, or keeping that constant, uh, not reducing that. So that gives us an idea of what our possibilities are. And this is a real challenge. This, this would actually require substantial shifts in terms of how we do things and how, um, uh, what types of benchmarks we're using as a country um, or, and globally. So when we think about these emissions and we think about how we can actually uh, pursue that, uh, those shifts, we need to think a little bit about what, what emissions look like globally. Now, there's a bunch of different ways that this is presented, but generally speaking, in terms of the top emitters for uh, emissions, uh, the top is China, um, followed by the United States. And depending on who you, what, what charts you look at, you'll see somewhat different numbers. But um, uh, car China does have the highest total emissions. Now, remember, part of the reason that China has this highest total emissions is China's producing a lot of the products for other countries around the world. So uh, in some senses, uh, other countries are exporting their emissions to China uh, because the, China's going to produce those items and, uh, and the emissions come from China. 
right? So the United States is producing a lot of emissions uh, globally. Um, if you look at per capita emissions, so here we're not just looking at total emissions, we're looking at per person how much emissions there are. The United States is, is a global leader um, in terms of emissions. Um, now, also when we think about this historically, we could also think about how much of the total bank of, uh, of carbon dioxide emissions have been produced uh, in different countries. And here we're seeing that the uh, European Union countries and the United States historically between 1850 and 2011 have produced about half of the overall emissions. So when we think about developing nations uh, and a lot of other countries around the globe, they really are not the ones who are producing these emissions. Um, uh, following up at that point, um, when we look at the United States uh, and per capita emissions, we're looking at around 16 tons per person, right? Uh, a lot of uh, sub-Saharan African countries, they're looking at about 0.1 ton per year per person, right? So we're looking at uh, orders of magnitude difference in terms of the impact that Americans are having versus other countries. So we, we really have a lot of work to do in the United States. Now, where do emissions come from? Well, they come from a range of different, or CO2 emissions, come from a range of different fuels. Uh, the biggest one is coal, but we have oil, gas, and uh, other, other sources as well. Um, if you look at this by sort of the sectors that are producing this, we see agriculture, forestry, et cetera, producing a fair number, uh, electricity and heat, heat production, another 25%, industry, transportation, and other sectors producing a fair bit as well. Methane is also an issue. Uh, we've talked about how methane uh, is not the primary driver of global warming, but it is a major driver of global warming. And we see that a lot of that is coming from uh, natural gas and uh, other uh, gas uh, production systems, petroleum systems. Uh, but a lot of it also comes from enteric production, that's from uh, livestock and uh, methane that comes from uh, cows, for example. Um, we also, there's a lot of release of gas. We see a lot of release of gas from, um, for example, permafrost thawing, uh, methane from permafrost thawing. Uh, I've talked about how it's being released from, uh, methane's being released from uh, where it's dissolved in water. We also have a lot of spillage of methane. So here's a picture of this, a uh, report that's put together by the New York Times, looking at um, many different facilities that are re releasing amazing amounts of methane. Since it's clear, we all know that it's actually releasing this, these, this pollution into the atmosphere. And here you see on one side the, the normal picture, but this is what it actually looks like in terms of the methane that's being released. Um, now, very often when we think about climate change, when we think about the ways that we can deal with and mitigate climate, we often focus on personal changes that we can make, buying electric vehicles, decreasing the way that we consume. Uh, and that is true. We are, individually, we do create demand for, uh, for energy and other things that cause climate change. But it's also important to remember that there are a fairly small number of companies and people who are making a lot of money off of carbon emissions. Huge, huge, huge amounts of money. Uh, and here we're talking about 100 companies that produce about 71% of global emissions on the whole. And you can look, you can find uh, there's lists of 100, you know, 100 or so people who are in charge of those companies that um, are uh, really responsible for these emissions. So this isn't entirely a uh, entirely anonymous process and problem. Um, uh, we can think about problems, uh, solving this problem in terms of personal solutions or smaller scale solutions, and we absolutely should. But we can also think about large scale systemic and policy based solutions that address companies and the types of demands that they're providing for and the profits they're making off of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, the other thing to think about, again, is how we set up our systems of incentives. So globally, uh, co countries put a huge amount of subsidies into production of fossil fuels. 
So we really incentivize the extraction and production of fossil fuels that will uh, impact global warming. Uh, so compare if you compare investments uh, and subsidies for renewables versus uh, fossil fuels, it's about 36 times as high. Now, there's some good news. Uh, we are starting to see shifts. So I talked about how coal is a major contributor to climate change uh, and, and gases. And what we're seeing is actually that there's a big drop in coal consumption in the United States. So coal is going down to uh, uh, around 1980s levels in, in 2018. So we are seeing a drop off, which is really promising. We're also seeing that a lot of coal plants are uh, either sometimes not, their proposals are not being accepted and they're being retired and um, um, some are announced retirements coming up in the future. But um, we do see that coal is, is on its way out and that's really encouraging. Emerging. Um, there's also some really good news in terms of renewable energy. So, uh, you know, I'll just talk about wind energy and solar energy, but wind energy could produce, um, globally could produce uh, about 40 times the electrical need that we have globally. Uh, and we see that capacity for uh, the, the, the wind energy that's actually being created is skyrocketing. And that's that energy is is far exceeding or that our ability to produce energy through wind is far exceeding what predictions were uh, back in 2000. So uh, what we find in 2018 is that we have 20 times, we've moved 20 times faster in terms of what we thought we would do in terms of wind energy. So that's really encouraging. Uh, solar energy is really also re a very promising strategy. So. Um, uh, we have enough energy reaching the earth every hour to provide a full year's worth of energy. So it's a very promising strategy if we can capture more of that solar energy. And we're seeing also for solar that its uh, installations are skyrocketing uh, internationally. And uh, when we look again at the projections for how fast this would happen, uh, what we actually see in 2018 is that we've exceeded those projections by 109 times. Right. So we're really doing a very good job of actually integrating solar effectively. Uh, very promising. We also see that um, the costs of these clean energy uh, technologies in the United States are really dropping off quite fast. So we're seeing substantial reductions uh, in energy uh, in energy costs. Uh, we'll also we also know that in the last five years, uh, energy uh, job, uh, clean energy related jobs has grown about six, six times faster than the overall economy. So there's a way in which we can view this as a, a growth market. So I would be remiss in talking about mitigation if I didn't also talk about co-benefits. So when we talk about climate change, we often talk about, um, you know, what we can do to mitigate um, global warming. And um, this is a cartoon that's pretty popular and you'll, you'll see it around. And essentially it's someone saying there, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? And the pre presenters up there are pointing out all the wonderful things that could actually happen if we actually do uh, pursue these measures to reduce emissions. So energy independence, uh, preserving rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean uh, water and air, healthy children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, health co-benefits are an area that I think are really promising for making the argument for why we really should invest in climate mitigation efforts. So health co-benefits are the benefits that we get that are independent of the benefits from reducing uh, uh, climate change impacts, right? So uh, these are things that that if we stop pollutions, uh, pollution or engage in certain actions, they will have independent health benefits. Now these independent benefits are rarely actually included in our benefits or in our estimates around the costs of adopting mitigation strategies. And uh, we could actually argue that uh, these co-health benefits could potentially actually pay for mitigation itself in many, many ways. So there's a lot of research that's actually suggesting that the benefits that we get overall would make it worthwhile to engage in mitigation in and of itself.
So what are some health co-benefits? So the de uh, decrease in air pollution and the impact on respiratory disease, uh, impacts on occupation and environmental hazards, uh, mental health uh, factors that you could consider in terms of ways that we change uh, uh, urban systems, etc. Um, having healthier diets, so moving to more plant-based diets has been associated with a wide range of different health benefits and uh, decrease in mortality. Uh, increasing physical activity, if we move towards using bicycles or decreasing uh, walking more, that actually has, we know that has tremendous health benefits. Uh, decreasing ground level ozone, which um, uh, has a range of respiratory and physical benefits, uh, benefit harms that we could we could avoid. Uh, unintended pregnancy, if we actually look at reproduction and uh, reproductive options as part of our way of addressing climate change. Um, we could think about urban heat islands uh, and the way that we could reduce them and uh, ecosystem health um, and the benefits that, that would provide. So, you know, uh, just to talk about an example here, when we're talking about pollution, worldwide air pollution kills 9 million people per year. That's a lot of people. That's a huge impact from this pollution. And if we could, if we think about this internationally, if we could decrease that pollution, that we're talking about a lot of lives that we could potentially save. Um, so again, as we think about these cli climate impacts, there is many ways in which uh, climate change can influence health. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about adaptation, the ways that we can address this at, future, at a future date. Now, one thing that I want to talk about here also is that um, the healthcare system itself actually also can really engage in thinking around climate mitigation. So there was a report, and this is the first report of the type, this type that I'm aware of, that actually tried to estimate how the healthcare system itself is uh, impacting climate change uh, and what that footprint, what that impact is in terms of uh, emissions. And it looked at a few different scopes and uh, in terms of the types of emissions that and impacts that uh, healthcare has. But you could look at, for example, the energy uh, used in uh, hospitals themselves, uh, vehicles that are used, um, anesthetic gas, for example. Um, uh, there's uh, two different types of an uh, an uh, gas used in anesthesia, sorry, anesthesia, mispronounce that. Um, and um, there's two types, one of which has relatively little impact on climate change, and the other type, which is still used very frequently, uh, has a huge impact it's a, in terms of climate change and global warming potential. So, um, uh, you know, that's some, an area that we could potentially make change in. And, and uh, we actually have, uh, here in the Seattle area, we've had um, hospitals that have actually switched the types of uh, gases that they're using to decrease their impact. Um, in other scopes, we could think about energy that we purchase um, uh, uh, and, uh, or purchase steam. We could also look at uh, scope three, which is uh, also I'll show you in a second, represents the bulk of these things, uh, the impacts, which is sort of uh, outsized or, or indirect impacts like business travel or the, all the supplies uh, that are produced uh, or long-term waste disposal of things or food uh, production in, uh, for healthcare or pharmaceuticals. So these are uh, other ways in which the healthcare system contributes to uh, climate emissions. So what they found in the study is that, in this report, is that uh, the big bulk of uh, healthcare impacts is from that scope three. And you can see the different factors that contribute to this, like transportation, agriculture, other things that are, are part of this. Um, but we also see that the sector one and sector two uh, have real opportunities for change to decrease healthcare's impact. Now, when we look at this per capita uh, internationally, what we see is, as we see in many other factors, is that the United States has an unusually large impact in terms of um, per capita um, health uh, climate impact. So uh, globally, it's it's um, has the highest impact. Uh, when we look at uh, contribute, uh, co contribution to healthcare emissions overall, the United States 
uh, in the health from healthcare, the United States represents about a, a quarter of all, all healthcare related emissions. Um, when we look at emissions in the United States, something that's notable is that in the United States uh, healthcare represents 7.6 percent of our United States emissions. Uh, on the whole. So that's uh, total emissions for the United States comes out of the healthcare industry. Now that's not entirely surprising given that, you know, healthcare represents about 20% of our GDP roughly. So uh, it makes sense that it would also contribute to emissions. But, uh, you know, that's a very substantial amount of, of, uh, of impact that we're seeing there. I will also note that it's higher than the global average impact, which is about four. Um, uh, uh, on average. So what things can you do in healthcare? So one is reducing healthcare's climate footprint now. So looking at some of the systems I talked about earlier that we can uh, impact to decrease climate impact. So how do we handle transportation? How do we source materials? How do we deal with waste disposal? How do we decrease um, that, the waste that we produce? Um, what types of gases do we use? Um, uh, how do uh, our how are our hospitals set up, and what is the uh, the energy efficiency of our structures? Um, how do we use energy? So all these different things that we can look at in healthcare settings to de decrease impact. Um, healthcare systems can also support these so societal transitions uh, by promoting and supporting movement toward renewable energy by. Uh, for example, investing or uh, providing uh, leadership in, the, in these areas. Uh, we could also chart a course towards zero emissions in healthcare by 2050. Uh, we can look at um, how we think about development, international global development, and how we can try and guide that towards uh, uh, decreased climate impacts. Um, and we can also look and help uh, create a government-based action plans for dealing with uh, and creating a climate smart health health system. And uh, a lot of this research and a lot of what we know is, is limited at this point. So we really do have this need for further research to understand this situation better. Uh, so this is uh, some of the recommendations that came out of this report uh, from uh, Healthcare Without Harm. So this is just a brief overview of climate change mitigation. There's a lot of different things that can be done. Uh, some of them I haven't talked about here. Uh, there's many different projects to try and think about the different things that you can we can actually effectively do to reduce those emissions. So uh, there's a, um, a resource which I posted, which I, I want you to look at, which is Project uh, Drawdown, which has actually looked at uh, about 100 different strategies for uh, climate uh, mitigation that are really promising and ranked it based upon how much of an impact it's likely to have. And all of those strategies are actually really quite promising, but it, it gave us it gives us some idea for what the most bang for our buck would be. And, you know, there's different uh, sort of lists and ideas for what we should do in terms of mitigating climate change impacts. Uh, so different organizations would probably rank this these different strategies differently, um, but we're thinking about um, a wide range of different things that you wouldn't necessarily expect, uh, ranging from uh, some of the top hitter hitters for Project Drawdown were things like um, uh, like uh, changing how we deal with refrigerants, which are having huge impact on climate change. That was actually the top one. Things like changing our, our diets to be more focused on plant-based sources. Things like um, education and reproductive options, right? Uh, there's a whole range of different things that we can do, uh, changes in how we deal with energy, solar, other types of renewable energies. There's a whole range of different tools and strategies that we can pursue that are really promising and can have these real positive benefits. And as I mentioned before, they can also have these positive uh, health co-benefits as well. So. Uh, these are all real promising options uh, when we think about optimistic futures and the ways that we can think about this as an opportunity, uh, diving into some of those options and thinking about them uh, and trying to think about how we can work together to pursue them is a real uh, interesting possibility for us all. So that's a brief introduction to some of these ideas.
Um, I think it's kind of interesting. It gives us an idea of where we're at and where we can potentially go. So thank you all for listening and uh, take care, everyone.